Thank you for checking out my YouTube channel today, The Study of Antiquity and the Middle Ages. I'm your host, Nick Barksdale, and today we are joined by a very special guest who is going to talk to us about an even more interesting and special subject in the Middle Ages, and that is medieval Sicily. Robin, thank you so much for coming on. Would you tell us a little bit about yourself today? I'm Robin Reich. I am a PhD candidate in medieval history at Columbia University. Um, I study interactions between Christians, Jews, and Muslims in the medieval Mediterranean through intellectual exchange and material culture. That is absolutely fascinating. It's honestly, I'm so jealous. <laughs> Robin is going to take us through by starting out by talking about a documentary, a documentary that aired by PBS. She's going to discuss that, give us her thoughts on the subject, and then we're going to go from there and travel into medieval Sicily from Spain. And the main topic today, dealing with medieval Spain, will be Convivencia. And ironically, I've chosen a title that'll be very similar to that, involving medieval Sicily. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us, and I hope you enjoy. Granada, Seville, Cordoba, and Toledo. For 800 years, the birthplace of extraordinary art, literature, and music have this culture created by Jews and Christians and Muslims. But it was a time also marked by violence. There were martyrdoms, there were executions. The remarkable story of the ornament of the world. So back in December, PBS aired a documentary titled Ornament of the World. It's a piece about the interfaith world of medieval Spain. And given that I work on the very related field of cross-cultural contact in medieval Sicily, I should have been excited to see it, but frankly, I was surprised <laughs> and somewhat exhausted by the thought that this movie had actually been made, because not only is it pers its perspective on interreligious contact old in, in the sense of it was left behind by the field of medieval studies almost 20 years ago, its entire approach to the question assumes that people of different religions should be inherently separate. The PBS documentary is based on a book published in 2002 by Maria Rosa Menacal of the same title, Ornament of the World. Menacal's work became particularly famous because it championed the idea of convivencia in medieval Spain, and this is the core issue I have with both the documentary um, and the book. Convivencia literally means living together. It's a concept used to describe Spain in the long period when it had a significant Muslim population between about the 8th and the 15th centuries. Convivencia describes Spain during this period as a pluralistic society in which Christians, Jews, and Muslims all live together as part of one broad community, despite moments of violence and discord. The theory came up in opposition to a somewhat more harmful narrative of the medieval world, which completely overlooked religious diversity and presented, uh, it pretended that Europeans were all white Christians who simply discovered Muslims in the 8th, 12th, and 15th centuries to their great surprise every time. But just because the previous theory was so obviously flawed doesn't mean that convivencia is a good way to think about interreligious contact either. The problem with convivencia among scholars was that it swung the pendulum too far to the other side. Menachal's original presentation seemed to completely gloss over moments that are often characterized as religious violence, such as the Crusades, in order to offer a rosy image of a pluralistic society. For this reason, convivencia as a theory has been the source of constant criticism in the almost 20 years since Ornament of the World was first published, and scholars who write about interreligious conflict have spent more time arguing why it's wrong than supporting it. In my area of medieval Sicily, prominent scholars such as Jeremy Johns have made a career of showing why things that have been seen as the physical evidence of interreligious collaboration, like blended architectural styles, can just as easily signify colonialism and other forms of cultural conquest that modern scholarship 
uh, since scholars like Franz Fanon, who was writing in the 60s and 70s, view as their own kind of violence. For me, though, it's the entire framing of the issue of interreligious contact that makes convivencia, as well as its predecessors and responders, problematic. All of these theories approach interreligious contact as a situation of clearly defined categories, Christian, Jewish, Muslim. But the medieval world is just as easily categorized by the sectarian divisions within these groups. For instance, the great schism between what would become the Eastern Orthodox and Roman Catholic churches, at the very least, meant that there were two major Christian groups that had significant differences in their religious doctrine and their practices, as well as resulting differences in their cultures, their ethnic compositions, and their languages. Orthodox or Greek Christians saw themselves as very separate from Catholic or Latin Christians to the point that they were two different religions, even though modern viewers simply see them both as Christian. Moreover, medieval Christianity still had a tremendous number of small sects that operated independently from either church and received a tremendous amount of ire from both. <laughs> This is one of the points that the Ornament of the World documentary just glosses over. Towards the end of the film, it introduces the Inquisition as the absolute end of convivencia and claimed that that movement of religious interrogation was meant to suss out these secret Jews and Muslims among recent Christian converts after 1492 when Judaism and uh, Islam were made illegal in Spain. But the documentary then quietly drops. The Inquisition was begun in 1480, so 12 years before that law was passed, as a means to force the conversion of non-compliant Christians. So the reality of medieval and early modern religiously motivated violence is that when it existed, which was pretty rare, it was much more within a single religious group than between major religions. This is true of the Crusades also. Although Ornament of the World suggests that the First Crusade was a Christian movement to eradicate Muslims from Jerusalem, which is a very popular opinion, it was very much a political power move by the Pope to take control of the area under the Greek Orthodox Church. There were also plenty of significant divisions within the Muslim world that make talk of things like Christian-Muslim relations difficult to pin down. Most clearly, there's the Sunni Shi'i division, which splits a huge portion of the population uh, of the Muslim community from the end of the 7th century on. Uh, and the divide there is over whether the leadership of Muslims broadly should be based on hereditary qualifications or not. But in the medieval Mediterranean, the label Muslim is also complicated by political and religious divisions that were not so clearly defined. Such divisions in North Africa became some of the most significant for the political and military history of the Middle Ages. Um, so as the Abbasid Caliphs in Baghdad lost their tight control over the lands to the west, and then the remaining Umayyad Caliphate in Spain crumpled, Spain and North Africa became a collection of largely independent and often warring kingdoms, emirates, and mini empires. And then on top of this, Berber tribes in North Africa such as those who came to be known as the Almoravids and the Almohads, moved between regions at a cross political systems, sometimes fighting with entire states, sometimes living within them. As within the religious Christian landscape, these Berber groups represent a movement to more tightly define Islam and stamp out those who didn't conform to the new standard, either within the religion or without. Within both Christianity and Islam, then, the two major religions that served as legitimizing forces for political regimes and movements, there were significant divisions and conflicts, and in response, there arose fundamentalist reform movements in the 11th and 12th centuries that would seize the narrative. Now, although Judaism is typically lumped in as the third religion of this group, medieval Jews were distinct from medieval Christians and Muslims in that they never had political autonomy or hegemony. So while we can now look at how Christians and Muslims both systematically treated minorities and themselves lived as minorities, we can't do the same for Jews. This puts medieval Jews in something of a passive role. We only ever see them responding to treatment rather than creating policy for how to deal with other groups. At the same time, Jews dominated the economic and intellectual worlds of the medieval Mediterranean. In that sense, it's again difficult to talk about them as a separate or distinct group. Because even as much as Jews often maintain separate communities defined by marriage or behavioral norms such as kashrut, which are dietary restrictions, 
so many individuals occupied such prominent or significant roles within Christian and Muslim societies that Jews as a group were inextricable. Uh, some scholars have written about how Jews as both individuals and groups served indispensable roles in medieval Christian society. I highly recommend in this vein that you look at Joseph Schatzmiller and David Friedenreich. Um, these Jews were had roles as merchants, art dealers, physicians, translators, and butchers. So really the whole range of social positions. So although there were these actions of collective violence against medieval Jews in Europe, which were very serious and absolutely are not something we should ignore, they were most often in but not of this dominant culture and they couldn't really be separated. With all these divisions and interweavings, I find that it makes no sense to still talk about medieval society in terms of these large groups as if we could pick them apart. Ornament of the World generally pleads ignorance on this issue. When the documentary finally gets to the Reconquista, the narrative of military conquest that joined Spain into a single country under Ferdinand and Isabella, the scholars interviewed act like the notion of Reconquista is utterly nonsensical. How could Christians reconquer something 700 years after they lost it? They couldn't possibly have any institutional memory of Christian Spain before the Muslims arrived or think of themselves as a se separate group. And this is absolutely true. And yet, by talking about medieval Spain as a collection of Christians, Jews, and Muslims, these very scholars have been supporting exactly that kind of thinking. We can't refute the ideology of ethno-nationalist movements like the Reconquista without also dismissing and dismantling the major religious divisions that support them. And that starts with seeing the complexity of diversity and pluralism. So we've talked a little bit about convivencia. In your view, how should someone like myself and others like me who we study history, but we're just novices. So how should we view convivencia? I think that everyone should approach convivencia as an, an idealistic perspective. Um, the, the reality of any kind of cross-cultural interaction is that they're going to be peaceful interactions, productive interactions, and violent or negative interactions. Um, and when you look at pluralistic societies, societies where there are um, people from these broad different groups living together, it's easy to break things up by the divisions of those groups. Um, Actually, we see this happening right now in India. You know, there's yes. this incredible um, violence and this nationalist movement going on, um, Hindus against Muslims, and that's been going on since the partition of India, of course. Um, and so it's very easy to say in these broad terms, these two groups don't get along, there's a lot of violence between them. But if you're looking more specifically down at the sort of day-to-day -day lived experience, um, or getting into the details of how these people define themselves, you're going to find a much more complicated picture that there isn't necessarily this overarching uh, tolerance and there isn't necessarily an overarching enmity, but that people in their daily lives are encountering other, plenty of other people who have some kind of different identity from them. And their choices about how to interact with those different people are based on what's convenient or practical for them in the moment. And sometimes it's based on ideology, but typically it's more based on what's convenient and practical. There has been a lot of scholarship about how the Mediterranean basically had a society that, a culture that existed across all of these groups that really couldn't be distinguished from one group to another. One of the amazing things that we actually see in medieval Sicily is this widespread use of Arabic by non-Muslim populations. You know, Arabic is completely associated with Islam. It is the language of Islam. It's the language that the Quran is written in, um, and it spreads as a language because of that. But in Sicily, at the low levels and at the high levels, um, there are Jews who are writing in a form of Arabic, um, Arabic that's mixed with Hebrew called Judeo-Arabic, and they are writing in that language because it's 
the lingua franca of the Mediterranean. It's how people communicate. Um, and so it's the language that they speak on a daily basis with most people. Um, they have little bits of Hebrew, but they probably mostly don't speak Hebrew very well. And then on the high levels, the administration in Norman Sicily was run trilingually. So it, all of their documents were published, um, were recorded in Arabic, Latin, or sort of proto-French um, and Greek. And that use of Arabic really seeps into the way that Norman kings were representing themselves in Sicily across the board. They have Arabic inscriptions on the buildings that they made. They put Arabic on their coins. Um, you know, that that was simply part of their culture, even though they had no religious connection to it. Now we are finally getting to the subject of medieval Sicily. And I'm really excited about this because from what we've talked about, it gets really interesting and incredibly complicated, like all things medieval. <laughs> so before the Normans come to the scene and in their very Vikingish way take over the area that we're about to discuss, let's talk about the frame and groundwork of the subject before the Normans arrive. Talk yeah. to us about pre-Norman Italy when it was under the control of Islamic factions. Yeah, so we have to understand about Sicily. Um, and first of all, when I say Sicily, I'm actually talking about more than just the island of Sicily. Um, I'm talking about a, a body of land separated by, by a little bit of water in the middle um, that goes onto the Italian peninsula up till about Naples. Um, this chunk of land has been this single unit for thousands of years. Um, this goes all the way back to when it was Greek territory known as Magna Graecia. Um, so under the ancient Greeks, when they expanded out, the first place that they really took hold of was this region that became Sicily. Um, and it's kind of the, the heartland of Greece, weirdly enough. That becomes the Roman Empire. The, the Romans you know, see that as their kind of big expansion into the Mediterranean. That's what helps them take over the Mediterranean as a whole. Um, and so when the Western Roman Empire falls, Sicily becomes kind of an emblem of taking control of the Mediterranean again. All of these other powers that are coming up um, in the, the late antique, early Middle Ages, um, they are using these former Roman territories to define their power. And that's how uh, the Islamic empires basically end up taking over Sicily. They're not necessarily looking at it for any particular reason other than the fact that it was part of Rome, so it's it's a good prize. Um, so it was very briefly, well, not that briefly, it was briefly part of the Byzantine Empire. Um, and then um, the Byzantine Empire has a bit of a crisis in the sixth century because of this first wave of the plague pandemic, um, and they completely lose control of most of their Western territories, including Sicily. Um, and uh, the Islamic expansion is able to take over Sicily. That expansion, when we talk about the early Islamic empire, we're talking about a bunch of different regimes that kind of move in quick succession. There's the initial expansion under Muhammad, then there's a further expansion under his successor caliphs, um, and then there are these dynasties um, that each take hold one by one. Um, and so Sicily gets taken by the Islamic Empire under that sort of second wave expansion um, by the successor caliphs when the Islamic Empire moves west, takes over pretty much all of North Africa, Sicily um, starts to creep into Spain a little bit. <laughs> uh, and uh, um, But then their power kind of breaks apart they have a very hard time uh, holding on to all of these different territories and maintaining it. They don't really have a central structure yet. Um, and there's a huge power struggle um, in the Islamic empire's heartland and the regime switches over to, to a new group. So it goes from the Umayyads to the Abbasids. Um, and when that happens, a, a bunch of sort of mini empires start popping up in other places. Um, and one of those is the Fatimids, which is based in Egypt. And so when Sicily 
actually becomes an Islamic territory, it's kind of a satellite colony of the Fatimids in Egypt. They don't really know what to do with Sicily. You know, traditionally, Sicily is a waypoint in the Mediterranean. It's your stopping over point because before navigational technology gets to you know, really technical ability to navigate with the stars, people sailing the Mediterranean actually can't sail without seeing the shore. They need a horizon that they can point to so that they know what direction they're going. So Sicily is this great way to get across the Mediterranean because you don't have to go all the way around. You can cut through the middle because it's such a big island so you can always see the shore. Um, and so the Fatimids take it over. It's not really connected to the rest of their empire. Um, and it basically becomes an almost independent trade state. Um, it's mostly run its, its importance really is as a major port for um, these Jewish merchants um, who are mostly operating out of Palermo, um, which is kind of, if there were a capital to Sicily, it would be Palermo. Um, it's in the, the northwest corner. Um, uh, so these Jewish merchants... Um, are conducting trade kind of independent of their political overlords, for lack of a better term, uh, from the, of the political administration. Um, they have their own network that's connecting them to um, uh, Tunisia, to Cairo, um, and also to uh, Cairo and Alexandria. Um, and that's pretty much... Sicily in in the Muslim period, you know, it's a little bit of a backwater, but it's an important um, trade state. It's moving a lot of um, exotic high value goods around. It's a major producer of textiles. It's a major producer of wheat. Um, it's kind of a, you know, farming community out in the boonies that no one <laughs> cares that much about. Um, and the, the Normans see it as you know up for the taking i was gonna say leave it to the normans to look at it and be like hmm everyone else basically just they like what it produces otherwise they pretend it doesn't exist except for the yeah. normans who apparently are tired of northern france so <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i mean i think the reason that the normans move in is you know the the group of normans that actually come in they're kind of the um the misfit cousins of william the conqueror um they don't have any particular like land or titles that they're going to inherit. Um, and so these two brothers set out to shake things up and make their own way. And they're like, you know, that land down south there, that looks pretty good. And we keep hearing about all these expensive goods that are coming from the Mediterranean. I wonder if we could get in on that. Maybe we should just, you know, buy some land in the Mediterranean. <laughs> And they, they do quite well for themselves from what little bit that I was able to read on it. <laughs> yes, yes, they do very well. They they um, get a foothold pretty quickly. It's pretty amazing. I mean, the fact that um, within a generation, they have a, a whole mini empire there. Yeah, that is, that is actually that is actually amazing. So before the Normans completely arrived to the scene... Can you tell us a little bit about the social relationship of Islamic Sicily between Muslims, Christian, and Jew? Yeah, a, a little bit. I mean, we don't know quite as much because it's it's not um, a topic that historians have been so interested in, um, and there's, there's not as much documentation of it. Um, but as with pretty much any place in the medieval world that is ruled by Muslims, there's a set regulation for how minority religions are supposed to be dealt with, um, and particularly Christians and Jews, um, because Muslims know that they are the sort of successor religion to Christianity and Judaism. Um, they know that they worship the same God. They respect that these other peoples have sort of not gotten the newest memo, but they're still <laughs> in the right place. Right. Um, and so the, uh, those people, um, those other minority religions, um, referred to often as people of the book, um, they 
under Islamic law are required to pay a poll tax. Um, and that basically says that they are accepted as part of Muslim society. They're going to be taken care of. They're not going to be attacked um, or driven out. Um, and they pay taxes, and that's pretty much it. Um, so within that system in Sicily, there are still um, Byzantines who, Byzantine Greeks, who are living um, in the region left over from when it was a Byzantine territory. Um, there are monasteries, there are you know, Greek churches um, all over the place that are kind of operating independently. Um, there is still trade with the Byzantine Empire. Um, and then there are these Jewish merchants who are moving around the Muslim world pretty much freely. Um, there is no indication that there's any particular political issue between these groups or any particular animosity between these groups. Most of the problems that are happening in Sicily during this period are between Muslim groups in the Mediterranean, especially um, between really along North Africa um, and with the places that it's bordering on. Um, there's, um, you know, there's not a central uh, empire controlling all of North Africa um, like there is in, say, the Middle East and the Eastern Mediterranean. And so there's um, the Fatimids in Cairo and they're ostensibly running most of North Africa, but they really don't have control over all these states. Um, and at one point, they kind of look over at Kairouan um, over in Tunisia, and they say, well, Kairouan's not really doing what it's supposed to be doing. I think at that point, it's under control by the Zirids, which are this sort of um, sub-empire group. Um, and uh, the Fatimids say, we'd like to get Kairouan back in our control. We're going to you know, send some guys out to rough them up and, and show them their place. Um, and so they hire this group of Berber mercenaries, basically. I think they're in the Banu Halal tribe. Um, and they send them out to Tunisia. And maybe the, the Fatimids don't realize, but the Banu Halal are fundamentalists. Um, they uh, don't like anyone who does not have exactly the same perspective on religion as they do. And their perspective on religion is that the only authority in Islam is the Quran. Not even Muhammad is an authority. He's just a guy. Um, and uh, so they're not fans of most other Muslims and definitely not Christians or Jews. Uh, and so <laughs> they come into Kairouan and they completely sack the city, really <laughs> destroy it. Um, it goes from being uh, one of the biggest trade centers and learning centers of the Mediterranean in the late antique period to basically being wiped off the map. It, it does not register anymore as an important city after that. And when that happens, um, there is a huge sort of refugee crisis of everyone they don't like fleeing out of there. And some of them go to Cairo, some of them go further east, um, and a lot of them end up in Sicily. Um, this is part of how those Jewish merchants actually get dispersed because most of them were originally based in Kairouan. Some of them choose to stay and they, they are able to stay there for about another hundred years, a couple more generations, but a lot of them go to Sicily, a lot of them go to Cairo, and some of them just hightail it out of the Mediterranean entirely and move to the Indian Ocean. The other thing that's happening in the in North Africa at this point politically is those same groups, those same Berber tribes that are being mobilized in this way, um, they end up moving even further west mm -hmm. and they get into what's now Morocco um, and the same kind of thing happens. They're hired as mercenaries in Spain and they eventually come in and take over Spain. Um, and that's that's a sort of big turning point in the history of Muslim Spain um, as it goes from being these uh, little independent uh, taifa states, um, kind of governorships, to being a central authority. Um, and in the same way, technically, they, they you know, approach minorities from this legalistic perspective. They have them pay the poll tax. They have them living in their society. But there is an uneasy kind of relationship with, with these religious minorities.
Now let's talk about the arrival of the Normans to Sicily. Can you describe to us the events that transpired that basically enabled the Normans to Kate to take control of the area? Yeah. Um, so, like I said, Sicily is this kind of backwater um, governorship within the Fatimid Empire, not really <laughs> as part of its central <laughs> government or being controlled very well. Um, and so there are these kind of mini emirs who control different parts of Sicily. And two of them get into a power struggle. And in the midst of this, these two Norman lords, uh, Roger I and Robert Kiscard, uh, these brothers coming down from France, they show up and they say, could we be of assistance? <laughs> and um, and the, the emirs are like, great. We would love to have some people fighting for us. And so the Normans join in on one side. They help um, that emir defeat the other emir. And then when he wins, they betray him and take over. Um, which, as you said, is a very Viking move. It's also exactly what they do in Ireland. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, pretty much, uh, I think, a century later, they do basically exactly the same thing in Ireland. And uh, along the way, they're kind of picking up territories on mainland Italy. They take Naples, they take um, Calabria, um, the larger region um, on the boot of Italy. Um, and then they uh, establish a presence in Palermo and mostly over the course of Roger II's reign, who's really the first king in Sicily, he actually crowns himself king. Um, they actually take control of the whole region, the whole island, and they even spread um, into North Africa. They take over most of coastal North Africa um, for maybe 40 years. They don't hold on to it for that long. They have a, they have a hard time with that. Um, and when they do take over, um, they're really trying to insert themselves as a successor to those emirs. They see themselves um, as coming in as Mediterranean rulers. Um, and so this is when they, mostly under Roger, they artificially start using Arabic and Greek in their documents, in their coinage. They start imitating Byzantine coins. Um, so this is one of the great power moves of uh, the Middle Ages is when you want to issue a currency, you just collect as much as you can of someone else's currency and re-stamp it, except with your face on it. Um, so this is something that Roger does, um, and they really set themselves up as the new Mediterranean power. So they don't care so much that they're French or Norwegian or however they're considering themselves at this point. They certainly don't care that they're Christian. Right. Um, they, they come in trying to get a piece of the Mediterranean pie. Um, and th this doesn't go well for them with their relationship with the Pope because the reason that they're kind of in Italy in the first place is because the Pope had sort of invited them in and said, you know, it's a little bit embarrassing to us that just south of where we're sitting, <laughs> we don't have any control. There's no Latin Christian presence. There's very little Christian presence to begin with. And what's there is Eastern Orthodox Greek Christianity. Um, and so we really would like you to set up a Christian kingdom. Um, and Ostensibly, the Normans do this. Technically, they're Christian. I think, personally, the Norman kings are Latin Christian. You know, they they celebrate a Catholic mass. Um, they mark the the holidays according to the Catholic calendar. But they don't really do the things that Christian kings are supposed to do. They don't endow a lot of Catholic monasteries. In fact, they start endowing uh, Eastern Orthodox monasteries, which. Those are the, the soldiers on the ground of Christianity. You know, the presence in most people's lives is the monastery that owns the land that you live on. Um, and so when the Normans actually start allowing these monasteries to build or to establish their landholding presence, they're giving those deeds to Greek Christians and saying, you know, go do what you've been doing. Give your mass in Greek, you know, celebrate Easter a month late or whatever and they're fine with that um, and and similarly it's it's a lot of anxiety in the catholic church they're allowing uh muslims to continue practicing and in some cases supporting muslim practice um and religion there's a lot of rumors 
at the end of Roger II's life that he was actually a secret Muslim. Um, and that he had this like deathbed conversion back to Christianity because he saw the light right before he was going to die. Um, <laughs> of course he did. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. That's awesome. So it sounds like, if I may say, that really when the Normans come in, these guys are not idiots. They're smart. They know how to work it. And so basically when they get in there, it's almost like they're like, hey, Y'all were doing great before we got here. Let's keep this going. Pretend we're just, you know, what have what has always been here, and y'all just keep doing your own thing, and we'll uh, kind of take the place of who was over you, basically. Yeah. Yeah, basically. I mean, this is... So much of Norman history is defined by Roger II. You know, he's the one who creates this kingdom, and he kind of sets the tone, and he establishes a lot of the, the visual language that he use, that they use. Um, he builds a lot of these initial... Um, great churches and other structures and um, the royal palace and it's definitely his vision you know he wants to see himself as a mediterranean king he wants to steal bits of the byzantine empire and kind of worm his way into that territory he wants to ingratiate himself with these um, muslim powers he sets up a kind of diplomatic relationship with cairo and the fatimids which ostensibly he's not supposed to do um, for <laughs> anyone, but they all seem very happy with it. The Fatimids are like, great, we got a trade partner in Sicily again, so this is going to work out really well for us. And he does a lot of um, patronizing Muslim arts, essentially. Um, you know, one of the, the most famous things that he patronizes is he commissions. Um, a geography by this North African geographer, al -Idrisi. And what's amazing about that work is that it's in Arabic, and it really never is translated into Latin. It's never part of the, the Latin intellectual sphere, but it becomes this huge text in the Eastern Mediterranean, and especially in the Islamic Arabic-speaking um, intellectual sphere. Um, and it's kind of an unprecedented work. It's a huge text of geography. It's a series of maps of Sicily and the Mediterranean and um, some parts of much further east, the Indian Ocean. Um, and it's a very thorough survey of all those places, but also descriptions of the land and the things that grow there and who lives there. It is really fully a work of geography, not just a work of cartography. And Roger seems to have no interest in making that a Latin or a Christian <laughs> product it's he says you know go make this thing in my name but do it in arabic and make it about the the islamic world you know he does the same thing with with objects that he commissions with buildings he famously commissions this massive silk cloak that he can wear at important state occasions um and he puts an inscription on the bottom of the cloak in arabic interesting across the board uh, Sicily becomes this place that is continuing to be part of the Arabic world in the same way it was under the Fatimids, but just now they have Norman kings instead. Right. And I think that's actually, since we're talking about him and his uh, really kind of going off the charts for, you know, taking this and taking that and really wanting to show them, hey, you know, I'm a lot like y'all, so on and so forth. You know, this is I'm I'm presenting myself as this almost like you could say multicultural aware type sure. guy. Um, that actually brings me to another very important question that you touched on earlier, and so it's basically the possible representation of colonialism through architecture. What yeah. can you tell us about that? Yeah. So. Like I said, you know, Roger commissions these big architectural pieces. They become the defining feature of the Normans in Sicily. Very famously, there's the Norman Palace in Palermo, but also the Capella Palatina, the palace chapel, which is a room inside that palace. These buildings, they're seen by modern art historians as this weird mix of styles. They don't look like... Um, Northern Europeans or Western Europeans, the way that they normally make buildings. Um, in fact, if a really good comparison is the Crusader states in places like Acre. When 
crusaders get there, they build um, typical Norman castles in the Eastern Mediterranean. They look very out of place. They look very blocky. Um, and they don't look anything like the kinds of castles that, say, Syrians are building um, in, you know, right next door. In contrast, in uh, Sicily, you get this unique, often referred to as a blended architectural style, but it's not really a blend. It's its own thing that clearly draws influence and inspiration from a bunch of other traditions. And it's confusing for us because it's not clear whether this happened organically, this is you know just how Sicilians saw themselves in this period, or whether it was something really intentional that um, Norman kings came in and said, I want a palace that makes me look like I'm an emir, that makes me look like I am a powerful Muslim lord and I just happen to be Christian. Um, and the distinction between those is really important for modern scholars um, in the post-colonial period and the period after all these modern empires have given up their territories because in the in the 18th and 19th centuries even into the 20th century we have this history of Europeans and Americans going into other places and trying to kind of go native they take over the local style of dress of architecture of art of you know food whatever and they make it their own and cut the people who actually originally used it out of the story. Um, they say, thank you, we'll take that. We don't care about you anymore. <laughs> and so it's, it's a politically complicated issue. So when we're looking at um, architecture in Norman Sicily, the Capella Palatina is kind of a great focal point for this uh, because it's a, a Romanesque basilica. It's a Catholic chapel. Um, it has the basic floor plan of any kind of Latin church that you would find in France or in England. So you've got a central aisle, two aisles down the side as well, and then a little nave and a kind of domed bit over that. But everything about the inside is completely different from that plan. You know, you don't have these kind of severe stone walls. Instead, there are these incredible mosaics that cover the inside, and it's very much in the style of a Byzantine church, um, where pre-iconoclasm, you would have depictions of saints and of Christ and the Virgin Mary. Um, there's uh, stories from the Bible, there's creation stories all around the outside, all along the ceiling. And then there is, in the part of the ceiling that's directly above the aisle, it switches over to this painted wood drop ceiling that's carved in a style known as mukarnas, which is typically referred to as an Islamic style, which doesn't really make sense because a building doesn't have a religion, but <laughs> um, it's, it's a style that shows up a lot in North African bathhouses and um, very occasionally in, in mosques in Egypt or bits of the Middle East. It's, it's pretty much a locally North African-centric style. And it's a carved geometric surface with these sort of little dimples in it, craters. Uh, sometimes it looks like mini buttresses um, in the corners. Um, really complex. And then the whole thing is painted with pictures of scenes of palace life, dancing girls and sultans kind of sitting around. Roger is in there painted as a sultan. Um, <laughs> Uh, people, musicians, people kind of going about their daily life in, in the court. So it's this bizarre mix of, well, it seems to us to be, bizarre mix of styles, but it does kind of work together. You know, there is a consistent theme to it. There is consistent color palette. These things were clearly designed together. And so it's very much intentional. It's not clear whether that's because that's what the craftspeople who built it knew how to do or whether Roger said, I want this style specifically, I want my palace chapel to look like a bathhouse. But the, the result is that you get something that is uniquely representative of Sicily under the Normans. This kind of, the baseline is Latin Christian, but then everything on top of it, the things that really define the culture are all of these blends of, of other bits of culture. Is it colonialist? 
I don't think so. I think it it is in the sense that it's obviously the Normans would not have done this if they hadn't been there, but it's what they were actually living. It was their reality, you know, for, for Roger II, for instance, he was not a Frenchman. He wasn't born in France. He was born in Sicily. He grew up, we think, speaking Greek. He had a sort of Greek tutor who was with him for a lot of his life. Um, he seems to have been very much a part of this Mediterranean culture. Um, and so I think it makes sense that he would have wanted his architecture to reflect that. And his successors do the same thing. In fact, you can see a real shift in what happens at the end of the Norman period. The last Norman king, ostensibly, is William II, who I believe is actually Roger's nephew. There's a kind of confusing um, succession that happens there. But after William, because he doesn't have a legitimate heir, it jumps to Frederick II, who is Roger's grandson through his daughter's side. Um, so, um, Roger's daughter gets married off to Frederick Barbarossa, mm -hmm. the Holy Roman Emperor in Austria. And um, their son, Frederick II, is now the person with the best claim to the Norman throne after William II dies. And so he is Austrian. He grows up in Vienna. Um, he's you know, steeped in that culture. And he comes to Sicily. And you can really see him putting on the costume of the Mediterranean. Um, he does kind of weird flamboyant things, like he buys a camel and keeps it in the palace as a pet. And the camel <laughs> dies because oh. camels don't belong in Sicily, they're not native. Um, and he, he commissions translations of um, Islamic science and, and he's very big about sort of establishing his presence as a European in a Mediterranean space. And he doesn't make any of this kind of architecture. He doesn't really know what to do with it. He doesn't know how to make a footprint in the Mediterranean in the same way that his um, his forebears, his his predecessors did, because they grew up in that environment. They had always lived in that. So even if at times they did kind of seem a little bit out of place, that was still where they belonged. They didn't have anywhere else that they belonged more. That's true. So you can definitely tell that he was not the uh, same fabric, I guess you could say, that they were. And uh, this is the, his, Barbarossa is his father? Yeah, Barbarossa. So this is the one who will drown in the river, right? Barbarossa? Barbarossa drowns in the river, yeah. yeah. And really embarrassing. Yeah, it's, that would be, that'd be, I can't, I can't even imagine. You embark on this amazing crusade and it's the river that gets you. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, even that is a huge difference because yeah. we have... Barbarossa, who's very excited to go on crusade, all for it. And on the other side, you have Roger I, mm -hmm. who shows up in Sicily and is like, well, I am not going on crusade. And not only am I not going on crusade, I am not funding my cousins to go on crusade. I'm not letting them stop in Sicily and use this as a restocking venue. That sounds like a terrible idea. Yeah, it sounds like, in a way, it sounds like he would be picking a side. Right. And that would be showing up red flags in Egypt and Spain and, you know, and so he was... Uh, he did not want to alienate these people that he was trying to impress. And, you know, most importantly, he wanted to get in on the Mediterranean trade. And even though trade still continues very actively when cru the Crusades are going on, as a political figure, if you want to be a part of that, you can't decide to also be at war with the people that you're trading with exactly. that doesn't make much sense exactly i think in his mind he realized that war is truly just bad for his business you know and yeah. so arguably a very smart man yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to say the least that is and that's interesting that you pointed out about how you don't necessarily view his architectural choices as colonialism because he you feel like he really recognizes the cultures that are already there and i think that's really interesting to point out is the fact that sure he's taken a lot from them to use himself because he has this idea of what he wants to be or at least what he wants to appear to be but at the same time he's not like alienating the people who were there before him and so right. he's making sure like it arguably, you could say his architecture almost yells, hey, there's more than just us here, if that makes sense. And so... Right. He's very into this religious pluralism that's going on 
Um, one of the things that um, the Normans do socially in, in Sicily is they become, they welcome refugees from North Africa. Um, so there's this continued refugee crisis starting in the mid-11th century, going through the 12th century, of um, people who've been displaced from North Africa by these Berber groups who are kind of tearing through. Um, and there are some arguments as to why they are being displaced. Some people will say it's the Normans themselves. That's <laughs> certainly a legitimate perspective. That might be it too. Um, but whatever it is, the Normans say, great, come to Sicily. We've got plenty of food here. We would love to have you. Um, and it allows them throughout the Norman period to have this migrant population that seasonally moves back and forth between Sicily and North Africa. Um, and we, we can look past that architecture, that sort of high level production and look to the things that those people in their daily lives are producing mm -hmm. and see how much they, they are part of that culture because the, um, the pottery of North Africa and Sicily is identical through most of this period. It's not two different groups. They don't use different objects. They don't make things differently. They make them exactly the same way um, until towards the end of the 12th century, the Norman kings kind of lose that ideology. More Lombards start coming in from the north. Um, Frederick comes in and takes over and they start pushing out Muslims. And that's where you start to see a divergence of these two pottery styles as those migrants stop coming back to Sicily. Right. So, and this really brings me to my last question specifically, and that is, would you say that as an idea, the term convivencia could be used to describe Norman Sicily, especially under Roger? Yes. As an idea, it can. Yeah. Um, the problem is that it has so many other connotations to right. it. I mean, if you just take the term as it is, living together, there are different groups that are living together. There are people who identify as technically different social groups. We're living in the same place. But they also all identify as Sicilians. Right. And that's kind of silly to say there are Sicilians living together because of course there are. They're all Sicilians. Um, there are also lots of people who come in there and visit and move away. Um, and then when you get into the connotations of convivencia as this kind of um, tolerance that's above religious division, there are obvious points against that. There mm -hmm. are certainly acts of religiously motivated violence in Sicily. They do happen. Um, but also... Their daily life is just more complicated than that. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's, I think that there's a good parallel in the way that um, modern Americans have changed the way we talk about our pluralistic society. Mm -hmm. We used to really love the term melting pot, and we don't like that as much anymore because the problem with melting pot is it implies that people have lost the culture that they came from. Yeah, that's true. And now we've sort of shifted to this idea of we are a nation of immigrants. Right. Um, that we maintain our cultures, but we're also all people who belong here. Um, and I think that that's a good way to look at it. You still have some sense of subgroup divisions, mm -hmm. but everyone's identity is still tied to the place that they live. Everyone still has a connection to that. So now, as we close this, I want to talk about your research and your dissertation. And let's talk about intellectual exchange during this period. What can you tell us about that that you found from your research? Yeah, um, so one of the, the ways that scholarship has kind of tried to make sense of this uh, interreligious interaction in Sicily is by looking at the movement of knowledge about science um, through Sicily. So there is this story that historians tell about um, Norman Sicily that this is the turning point where um, Latin literate peoples 
suddenly have access to scientific scholarship that's only been in Arabic or Greek um, throughout the whole Middle Ages up until this point. That there is a large-scale translation movement that happens in Sicily um, that makes available not only medieval Arabic scholarship and medieval Greek scholarship, but also classical scholarship that was originally written in Greek or Latin that's been lost in the West because it had been preserved in Arabic and Greek. Mm -hmm. And that it comes over and gets translated into Latin, and then suddenly Latin-speaking, writing, reading peoples are uh, immersed in this knowledge once again, and this leads them to the Renaissance and the scientific revolution, and that's kind of the dawn of um, modern Europe as we know it. And I have a lot of problems with this narrative. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, there, there are so many issues that I'm, I'm sure you can anticipate from things that I've said here. You know, the idea that knowledge belongs to one group of people and not to another, that you can move this culture sort of as a package. But even outside of that sort of theoretical issue, there's just no evidence that that happened. We don't have translations from this period. We have pretty much two translations at all from Northern Sicily. Um, but on the other side, we do know that this happened in Spain. Mm. We have tons of translations from Spain. Um, and, and that's a great example of how the kind of dynamics that we've been talking about are very different in Spain from how they are in Sicily. Um, for among other reasons, the fact that Spain is an Arabic Muslim society mm -hmm. for 800 years. Right. Um, you know, it has an active scholarly tradition that is completely independent in Spain. Um, so what what actually happens in Sicily is people aren't translating scientific texts. They're talking about ideas about science uh, in an intellectual sphere sometimes, you know, sort of word of mouth. I tell you, hey, I read this really interesting book about optics and how eyes work or you know about geography um and and it just blew my mind and i just want to tell you about it um and so that guy who now doesn't read arabic but who writes in latin mm -hmm. writes a whole thing because he's all inspired by that idea um that happens but also the science is not just uh, an intellectual um you know theory, it's how people interact with objects. So we start to see um, Sicilian culture using features of uh, Arabic, Islamic, Byzantine culture um, that's informed by science. So um, in the Norman period, for instance, Normans become obsessed with copper. It is everywhere in their material culture. They um, they make gigantic copper doors. Um, they make um, large-scale copper um, statues, but they completely reform their currency so that it's mostly copper, um, which seems like an odd choice. But then one of the weirdest things they do is that they bake it into their pottery. Their pottery is mostly colored with copper um, because this really distinctive green color. Um, and the reason that I think they're so interested in it is because copper is a huge part of alchemy in this period. Um, oh. Alchemy is obsessed with how alchemy is broadly the study of metals. Um, and metals are this great kind of um, avenue to study transmutation and how one thing can become another thing. And copper is a beautiful illustration of that because... You take copper and you can refine it and melt it down so it goes from a solid to a liquid back to a solid um, but you can also change its color really easily um, so you know it naturally turns green and it doesn't rust it just turns green um, you can make it look like gold you can make it look like silver um, it has all these wacky properties um, and so normans start using copper in everything as part of this representation of this ideology of alchemy that's coming through to them by word of mouth or that they're reading in Arabic and then eventually they start writing about it in Latin 
but they never translate those texts in, from oh. Arabic. They never are actually saying, well, what do the Arabic scholars say about this? We need to put it in Latin so that we can understand it. They get those ideas through their use of copper, through their working with that metal, and then they start writing about it in Latin. Um, in the same way, they do this with trade. Um, when the Normans had come in, they were really interested in engaging in that Eastern Mediterranean trade. The, the thing that they're really moving around, the goods that they're known for, uh, are spices from the Indian Ocean. Spices we think of as food. Right. It's that you put on your food to make it more interesting. For medieval peoples, especially for people in the Mediterranean, spices are not just foods, they're, they're things that have, again, transformative properties. And because of those transformative properties, they're really valuable, but they can only be sold in small quantities. They're rare. Um, and they're not just things that you would put in food, but they are sometimes metals. Mm -hmm. um, they're often precious stones. Um, and then a lot of the time, they're, they're things that are inorganic that you wouldn't eat, but you might put on something. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, they're using like animal parts or, or whatever. Um, and that again makes this kind of awkward jump where there is scholarship about spices in Arabic that eventually we start to see in Latin as well. But those texts again are not translated. Um, instead they, we see this active spice trade that maintains through the Norman period, um, but the things that they're trading and the way that they're using them changes as they kind of learn more about these um, medical traditions, um, and especially as Sicily becomes known as a center of medical learning. Um, they kind of shift spices over from being these transformative goods that are used all throughout Sicilian culture, so as medicines, but also as craft products, they're used especially in that textile industry that was so important in the Muslim period, to just being used as medicines. The, the Normans kind of distill that aspect of the culture um, and then formalize it and write it down. So the first time we even see those ideas appearing in Latin, it's completely outside the context of um, the Arabic texts that those ideas originally came from. Thank you everyone for checking out this episode today on a very fascinating subject and journey throughout the complicated world of not just the medieval society and the medieval world, but also medieval Sicily specifically. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for watching today. And Robin, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It has been a pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen, do not forget to check out the links in the video description below to where you will find her awesome history blog where she talks about her favorite subjects or researches, so on and so forth, but also to her academia profile and to the work that she and her colleagues are doing to better educate people like me and you on the subjects that we love. Ladies and gentlemen, have a wonderful night.